It is Aaron LeBauer with LeBauer Consulting and the Cash PT Lunch Hour, and you guys are in the right place. This is um, Cash PT Lunch Hour number 11. It's March 2016, um, and I'm super excited to uh, have a, have my awesome guest on today, and we just got her on in the nick of time, and uh, <laughs> it's really great. So um, for those of you that are here, please let me know that you can hear us okay. Uh, so type in the chat box, like, I can hear you, but also type in there where you're calling in from because it'd be awesome to know where, it's also always awesome to know where people are calling in and who's here. Um, so just let us know you can hear us, and I'm waiting for a few other people to get in the in the room before we start, um, probably another minute or two. And I'm just going to type in a message, but um, this is live, so if anytime something happens with your browser, all you got to do is click refresh, like if your sound drops out or something happens, it's uh, likely an internet issue. Um, sometimes it's a computer issue. All you got to do is restart and that'll usually pop you right back in. So let us know. Um, you can hear us okay. Hi, guys. All right, awesome. Hey, I can see um, a whole bunch of people here. Linda and Kendall from South Carolina. I guess that's Beaufort instead of Beaufort. And North Carolina is Beaufort. And then Roxy um, from California. Awesome. So this is really great. So what we're going to get started in just a second. And let me introduce my guest um, today. We have with us Vanessa Fox. And Vanessa is a occupational therapist and uh, cash-based practice owner. So she owns, her practice is called Movement with Meaning. It's a uh, cash-based pediatric occupational therapy practice. Her mission, as she states on her website, this her mission is, is awesome, is to empower parents to guide their children to reach their highest potential at any age, to live a meaningful life through learning, persistence, and fun. So um, I just want to give a, a warm uh, a welcome to my guest this week, Vanessa. Hey, Vanessa. Hey, thanks for introducing me. What a nice yeah. introduction. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. So um, would you take a few moments to introduce yourself and Tell us, you know, how'd you get into um, occupational therapy and a little bit about your background? Okay, sure. So I knew when I was 16 years old that I wanted to be an OT. Um, I had a mentor in my life that suggested to me, you know, I think that this would be a great career for you. And I had no idea what it was at the time. So I did a whole bunch of research. Um, I knew it was something like physical therapy, but I didn't understand the difference. And I still don't think I understood the difference until I actually like was in my career. Um, but I got into it um, at 16. I realized, yep, this is what I want to do. Um, I went to undergrad in Minnesota at St. Cloud State. Um, got my undergrad in psychology, knowing that I was going to go to OT school afterwards. Um, and then I prepared myself to have the prereqs and everything done on time. Um, went straight into grad school at OT or at uh, UF in Gaines. So, and um, then I knew um, on one of my rotations that I wanted to do pediatrics. Hands down, it was the most fun environment for me. I had an amazing CI. I had an amazing boss. The internship was great, and it actually turned into a job. Um, I worked there for four, four and a half years, um, and then I decided, you know, I want to grow into something else. I want to grow into something different, um, and that's when a year, almost a year and a half ago, wow, I can't believe it's been that long, um, I started my own private practice, so that's how I got started. That's awesome. That's really mm -hmm. great. Yeah. So um, was there like a was something specific that happened or a moment in your life you're like, everything became clear, like, this is what this is what I want to do or what I have to do. Like, this is why I want to go to OT. Mm. I mean, you kind of touched on it, but, you know, or is there is there a thing that was like, okay, this is why I want to open my own practice? Was there, like, the pivotal mo moment or story or something? Yeah, there was two pivotal stories. So first pivotal story that got me into OT school was I actually went through a trauma when I was a teenager. Um, I had a tumor on my, you know, your parathyroid gland is in your throat. It's just shaped like a butterfly. Um, you have four parathyroid glands. I had a tumor on my lower left parathyroid gland, and um, it caused two years of illness of ongoing things that I was in and out of therapy, in and out of the hospital for. And I just created... Um, 
um, such a respect for the health profession field of any job that I just knew that that is, was my calling. I knew that that was something that I needed to do. I'm a very compassionate person. So that led me into the exploration of OT altogether. Um, then I would say uh, the reason, the pivotal point for me creating my own private practice was um, I was working in a really large children's hospital in the outpatient center. And um, I just saw some things that I wanted to fix about the system. Um, I saw huge waiting lists for kids that I wanted to be able to reach out to and say, hey, like you could really benefit from this therapy, but because you are not medically based, we can't provide this service for you right away, but you can wait for a year until we have a spot open for you. So it's like telling a parent when you evaluate their child that there's something wrong with your child, but we can't do anything for you. That was devastating to me. And I was a person that gave 100% to my job. Um, and then on top of that, I just, I was placed on, I had so many demands placed on me. Um, you know, productivity is a huge push in the corporate world and in the hospital based settings. So to be able to meet both of those, my standard of what I needed to do for my job, um, as far as my own instincts and my own compassion versus their productivity, it just created a burnout system on me. And I was not happy with that. And I had to start evaluating every year, your annual review comes around and I'm looking at that annual review thinking this is not where I'm supposed to be in five years. Where am I supposed to be? Finally at that fourth year, I was just like, okay, this is, I need to create my own practice. And these are the models and um, the things that I think that are going to fill me up, but also benefit my clients the most. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Uh Oh, lost your video a little bit there. Are Phone you still call. with us? Yeah. Yes. I'm okay. here. Phone call. It <laughs> messed it up sorry yeah no problem no problem yeah um, yeah yeah that's cool so um was there let me ask you a few questions so your your first job this first job it was was it in a pediatric facility or a hospital or what, yeah what so that? it was an outpatient clinic of a hospital it was um all children's johns hopkins medicine in st petersburg florida okay um an amazing facility um one of the only freestanding pediatric hospitals in florida so there's three freestanding if you know what i mean by freestanding it's well, only I mean, pediatrics it's only pediatrics yeah. yeah exactly there's no adults so they specialize in that um so we had a lot of specialized program amazing training like i am so glad that that was my foundation and my start to the pediatric mm -hmm. world um because hands down it's made me the therapist that i am today yeah truly yeah. awesome truly. yeah um so how did you have to see like your productivity was it like see like a certain number of patients a day or a certain number of patients a week type of thing yeah basically um we had to be it sounds low but our productivity um if you've been in the pediatric world or just any productivity based world, um, we had to be 62% of 100, which meant I needed to see about I needed to have on my caseload, I needed to have about 30 to 40 clients on my caseload, we had hour long sessions. Um, and then some half hour long sessions, but in a day, I would see eight to 10 maybe 11 patients in a day. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's a 10 hour day or eight that's, hours? Yeah, no, that's a 10 hour day usually. Uh, yeah. Uh, yep. So were you doing like three 12 hour shifts type of thing or was this like mm -hmm. just five 10 hour days? It was four tens, but you know, your four tens didn't really stop at that 10th hour yeah. because you have all that paperwork to do because with pediatrics, it's really hard to do um, documentation at the same time. So mm -hmm. there were some clients you were able to do that with. And there was a standard um, in the um, in the facility that I worked at. Like we just kind of let our parents know that 10 minutes of our time at the end of the session is for documentation and parent education. But in my brain, I was like, I need way more than 10 minutes to educate these parents on how to carry over the skills that we just mm -hmm. worked on for the last hour. So that's really become a main focus in my current practice is educating the parents because that carryover is so much greater once the parents have those skills that I'm able to um, get from their child. So that's awesome. pretty neat. Yeah, awesome. it's pretty neat. Did you have, um, so in transitioning from your, from your job to your practice, Mm -hmm. Did you have, were you like, okay, I need to go to a cash-based practice. I just want to do a, 
uh, private practice and did you have like anyone to help you or mentors or examples of like who what you learned how you learned how to do that yeah great question um first off i didn't know the word cash based practice even existed <laughs> i knew that i didn't want to take insurance um because for me that just led to um a lot less quality time and a lot less um direct patient care time which is what i'm most passionate about um and allows me more freedom with my clients to be able to spend more time with them um so i knew initially that that's the route that i wanted to take once I figured that out, I didn't know the steps that I needed to take to actually become an independent practitioner, um, mm -hmm. legally, um, professionally, and just all of those things. There were some skills that I needed to develop. So I sought out a business coach. Um, my business coach mentored me for six months. Um, I actually joined a couple different networking groups as well, too, that really helped me along the way, kind of... Um, just with people that set me up with the right uh, tools and right resources. So through networking groups, I found a CPA, I found an attorney that actually offered his services pro bono to me. Mm -hmm. um, so awesome. just, yeah, <laughs> it was awesome. Um, the initial setup of that was just, it was great. And just meeting other people along the way too, that kind of supported me um, and business owners as well too, was key in knowing, okay, this is what I have to prepare myself for. This is what I need to look forward to. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Those are awesome. key, key people. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a kind of follow-up question for that is, what did you do? Like, how did you transition to your own practice? Did you start working part-time? Did you just jump in with both feet? Did you, you know, how, how did you make that work? And I love this question because I feel like I did something that I would never advise people to do. Yeah. I was just like, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to quit my full-time job. Um, I'm just going to see if I can do it on my own right away. Um, and that was harder than I thought right away. Um, just to like jump from what I was doing 40 plus hours a week full time mm -hmm. um, into finding my own clients and starting my own clients. Um, so what I ended up doing was after a few weeks, I was like, okay, you know what, what's close to my model? Um, so I found an early intervention job where early intervention travels to homes. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was close to my model, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. It wasn't, um, quite hands on enough with the kids because early intervention is almost like a coaching model for the parents and you mm -hmm. don't interact with the child a lot. Um, which is not quite what I do, but it was good for me to have that experience because all I had prior to that was the four and a half years at an outpatient clinic. So I needed to see a different setting because my model is not the same as either one of those. Right. Um, and then that wasn't, um, producing enough, um, I don't know. It just, it, if income wise, it, when I was trying to transition out of that 40 hour a week job into that early intervention job, wasn't enough income right away. And then I didn't have enough of my own clients to be meeting, making ends meet. Um, so I found, because I knew I did not want to go back into the pediatric world because of, we can get into this later too, there becomes non solicitation and contractual agreements that you mm -hmm. can't be treating your own children at the same time as you're working in a pediatric facility because they think that you're going to be taking clients from them. Um, so I knew I needed to work with adults. So I found an adult inpatient job where I just worked two days a week and one weekend. And then I was able to build my private practice successfully because I had that adult transition. I was able to leave everything there. And it was so much easier for me once I found that, that mm -hmm. everything just started taking off from there. And that was about like six months in to it so okay yeah 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 awesome and then how long did that job last like how long did you say that um about seven months so mm -hmm. just recently just recently i stopped awesome. working there yeah congratulations yeah. that's yeah. right that's really yeah. great thank you thank you very cool so will you tell us a little bit about your current like i want to know more about your business i know a lot of people who are on the on the call here want to know about you know, like mm -hmm. what are you doing and how are you being successful so will you just tell us a little yeah. about what's your model of practice how does it work and what are you doing with patients? Okay, so first of all, let's just talk about the cash-based part because 
Um, for me, I feel like everybody in cash-based pay kind of has their own payment systems. Um, what's worked best through some trial and error for me is a fee-for-service model. Um, and that's how I explain it to parents. So I have a fee-for-service model. I consider myself somewhat of a community OT because um, my practice locations, I go into people's homes. Um, and then that's a big selling point for the parents because mm. – it's just convenient for them. They don't have to travel anywhere. I go to them. Um, and then they're also able to get more carryover of skills of what the children are learning in therapy at their home environment, which is where they need it the most. Um, and not only that, I go to their homes, but I also have found a great uh, kids gym that I work out of. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody has ever heard of We Rock the Spectrum, but it's a franchise gym. It's all over the United States. Um, I know the gym owner of... Um, a We Rock the Spectrum gym in a city nearby me. It's like 20 miles away. Um, but I actually treat out of that gym as well, too. So it's a sensory-based, like, OT's dream, but it's not associated with any clinic or hospital. So I go there if the people don't have equipment in their homes and treat out of that clinic. And say the reason why community comes in, because I'm not just an at-home therapist, um, mm -hmm. community comes in because I take patients to the park, I take patients to the beach. There's another patient that actually wants me to take her to the mall so we can work on like money skills and she is wheelchair bound. So mm -hmm. we need to work on like in and out of curbs, in and out of doors, all different sorts of things of functional mobility that she needs to work on. So it's pretty neat that I'm able to flex and be able to do that. That's really awesome. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. great. So how many, um, how many patients a day are you seeing? So, and because and you're traveling to them. So there's, yeah, travel. yeah, yeah. I see four to five patients a day. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that's an average. So depending on if I have a new eval that week, something like that, um, it changes, I would say it changes every month. So mm -hmm. four to five is my typical right now. Okay. And then, um, are you, how long are you spending with patients? An hour, hour and a half? Less, I would say in, no, always an hour. It usually runs a little bit over because I end up spending direct time with the child. I end up spending 45 to 50 minutes and then another mm -hmm. like 20 to 25 minutes with the parent educating. Okay. And how old are the kids that you're working with? Right now, my current caseload is between three and 12. Um, but I mean, I would see and I'm branching out into other areas, but I would see mm -hmm. zero to 16 as my age, okay. age limits. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Is there like a particular problem that most of your patients have or, or something that the parents want for them that they're not getting elsewhere? Yes. So I would say... The, okay, the criteria for me to work with a client um, or work with a child is that the, the parent needs to come up with a functional um, deficit that their child has. And by functional, I mean it needs to be impacting their daily routines. It needs to be negatively impacting the family. Mm -hmm. um, it needs to be either impacting their school or it, engagement in extracurricular activities. So if they can identify one of those, I don't tell the parents this right offhand, um, but it, it, it's helpful for me to know, um, you know, are you struggling with any of these areas? Because then we are a good match because these are the things that I specialize in. So I would say all of the kids that I work with have those four common problems. Um, and then their diagnoses range anywhere from sensory processing disorder, autism, cerebral palsy, developmental coordination disorder. Um, it's a gamut of things, mm -hmm. but those I would say are the four most common. So, uh -huh. yeah. Are you seeing, are these kids also in schools as well? Or are they, you know, some of them. and how's that working? Because yeah, how's that work? I also explain how that works where you live, mm -hmm. um, because where we live, there's, uh, you know, we've got the school systems provide some OT and PT. Mm -hmm. um, we've also got uh, some people get it through Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there's big gaps all over the place. And also mm -hmm. in Greensboro, we've got a facility, a school that's just for um, kids with um, developmental delay and disabilities etc. But they've moved a lot of kids out of there and into the regular classrooms. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just it kind of depends like they've got the best therapy pool in the state probably and it's only open two hours a day. <laughs> you know, it's like a waste wow. of space. Yeah. But you know, so can you explain like, or, you know, in your town, and where do you fit with all with the other services that Those some of the other services are able to get? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So 
I would say that um, it's almost in my area, they have all of those things as well, too. The kids that I treat, um, I would say 80% of them go to school and the other 20%, um, they're either homeschooled or they don't go to school. Mm -hmm. Um, so what happens with the kids that do go to school, if they get OT or PT or speech in school, um, Unfortunately, I don't mean to downplay the therapists at the schools at all, but because their productivity requirements are skyrocketing ridiculous, they have to see, I think, 60 patients um, or 60 kids in a week. Mm. So they have half hour sessions, but um, they don't get a lot of time to work on the skills that the child is having difficulty with. So that child may only get a half hour of OT or PT in the school when they really need a full hour two times a week or more. So I'm able to talk to parents about that. But a lot of times parents already even come to me and they're frustrated with the therapy that their child is or is not getting in school because it's mm -hmm. hard for kids to get services in school here for some reason. Um, so one of the things that I also do to complement their child in school, if they're already getting services is sometimes they're having difficulty in the classroom. So what I'm able to provide them with is um, IEP accommodations or recommendations. I write a report for them. Um, and the other thing um, that I also do is visit the teachers that creates another connection with me of people to visit mm -hmm. the teachers, um, but then kind of educating the teachers on how this child can succeed because the OT that they work with in school doesn't necessarily have the time to go visit with the teachers about, um, you know, this specific child. And even if they do, it's great because the OTs that are working together already want somebody else to collaborate with. Like they're like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm having difficulty with this child can I get somebody else's opinion on what else you would do for him? Um, so it's really it actually is very much of a collaboration rather than any competition or anything like that. So and it's really nice. That's really awesome. But yeah. you've got like this space where you fit, where you can offer something that people aren't getting. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Truly. And that's, that's like one of the vital, uh, uh, attributes of a successful practice is you got to mm -hmm. have something mm -hmm. that people need and want and, or any business basically. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's, let's jump a little bit to um, you know, some marketing. So how do you get people to find out about you? Like, how, what did you do? Was there, was there one successful strategy you used to get started or, or, and were there things that you did that didn't pan out? And you know, like, <laughs> what are you doing to get the word out about your uh, practice? I love that question. Um, first, before I start, your screen is frozen for me. Oh, um, I can yeah. hear you just fine, but you're not moving. Yeah, that's okay. I'm moving in okay. real life. So. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. I didn't know if anybody else was having that issue. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Marketing. The first thing that I did was I knew I needed to have a website. Um, so I am one of those people that I'm very goal driven and I was like, I'm going to get this thing done. I'm going to get it cranked out, but I knew I couldn't do it by myself. So I had somebody help me develop a website um, and I got that up within three months. Like that was just up right away. One of the first things that I did um, that helped, but it wasn't enough. Um, I would say the next thing that I did was go to doctor's offices around the area, um, introduce myself to the nurses, the doctors, everybody in that office. Um, I would do lunches. Um, what else did I do in the beginning? Oh, I would go to like networking events that weren't necessarily um, for health professionals, just going to different um, business um, like BNI. I don't know if you've heard of that. Mm -hmm. um, I would go speak about um, my business at BNI. There's other things that are spinoffs of that in my area. And so I would go to those meetings as well. Um, I found a couple of clients through that. Um, the other things that I would do is I had um, articles. So when I would go back to these doctor's offices, I would bring the articles so that the parents could read it in the waiting rooms. Um, and it would have all, all my contact information on it. And it was articles about, um, I don't know if you saw that. I got a text message. Sorry. <laughs> Glitches okay. of using a phone. <laughs> right, right, right. That's okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then they would have all my contact information on that. 
um, it, and it kind of transitioned actually from marketing in that format to once I had more clients, um, I really wanted to get to know the clients that I had and who they were already working with and not in terms of doctors, but in terms of any health professionals, in terms of teachers, mm -hmm. if they were doing extracurricular activities like soccer or gymnastics, um, anything like that, if they were struggling in any one of those areas, I really wanted to know because I personally just wanted to know how I could help the child feel like they were um, fitting in with their peers because a lot of the kids that I work with don't fit in with peers and that's a number one struggle or concern that parents have so once I was able to identify those key people in that child's life that influence how um, they're socializing uh, I actually went and was able to speak with these people go create treatment sessions around um, their uh, needs so let's say I had a girl that needed help in gymnastics um, she was afraid of changing her head position. Um, anytime she would go to tumble or something, she would just have a complete meltdown. Anytime mm -hmm. she had to climb a ladder and use her hands, she would have a complete meltdown. So once mom described this to me, I said, okay, I want to go observe this and see what's going on. Um, I found out what was going on. I was able to coach mom through it, kind of change how they were interacting. And then, I mean, she needed OT on top of that, but also be able to reach out to her gymnastics teacher and say, hey, you know, I see, um, you know, we could approach things in this way to maybe help her be more successful and you be less stressed when you're trying to help her in class. Because this gymnastics teacher had like 20 some kids in class all by herself. Mm -hmm. So those teachers appreciate the extra help. But then that gets my name out there like, oh, they know I'm an OT. And then I've gotten referrals from those people. Um, so a lot of my success has been through word of mouth and me introducing and interacting with people. Because once they see that, um, that interaction, I mean, your image and your words can only speak so much if they see that marketing material mm -hmm. in like a print or an online format. But once they meet you in person, that is a huge game changer. Um, I just I found that speaking on the phone with potential parents that are interested, even if I don't um, take them on as a client for whatever reason, if I am able to give them my time and really a listening ear, I'll get continued referrals from those people patients as well too that didn't even become my own clients so uh -huh. yeah it's really been just um networking through what i already have awesome are you doing yeah. anything to cultivate that or is that just happening kind of organically very yeah. organically i mean i cultivate that feeling in myself mm -hmm. <laughs> if that makes sense like i just want to empower other people and let them know about the resources um but yeah it's very organic and yeah. that's what's been working for me Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, is there, is there anything else that you tried that you were like, Oh, I'm not doing that again. Cause it didn't work. Or, you know, was it <laughs> yeah. Remember marketing? that, remember yeah. that stuff I was talking about in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff didn't work very well. Okay. Um, so it was like going to the doctor's offices and, um, you know, some of that worked, I did get referrals from that, but it wasn't ongoing. It was mm -hmm. like, they remembered me. And that part I wasn't consistent with because being a mobile therapist, it was very hard to get to the um, doctor's offices consistently to establish that relationship. So I take part of the fall in that um, not working out so well, but the lunches, oh my gosh, no, I never got referrals from the lunches. Yeah. It was always like, if I dropped my cards off and introduced myself and established that like connection three or four times, um, you know, that was what helped, but the lunches never produced anything. And I had to cater to the, mm -hmm. um, to the doctors as well too. So I would be buying, you know, 200, $300 lunches for 20 some people. Um, and it was just, I would, I would not recommend going that route. Right. <laughs> It was not uh, helpful for me. <laughs> I agree. <Yep. laughs> um, awesome. So um, were there any other, like up until today, I mean, in the last year, there any other like mistakes you made, like other areas of business or hard lessons you had to learn? Anything that you uh, want to pass on? Yeah. Um, I had to learn how to be a saleswoman. Mm -hmm. I, whoa, I did not know how to do that. Um, and that's really where my business coach came in. Um, I mean, just passing on a few little pointers from what I learned from her. Uh, I guess that the biggest thing that I learned is to listen to what your clients need. Stop telling them what you think they need. Um, and once I started really listening and if I realized that they were a good match for my services, um, I was able to, um, 
I was able to relay back to them the information that they mirror, really mirror back to them, the information that they already told me, um, and then be able to, if the price I thought was for them, um, based off of what I already knew about them, going to be too high, um, then I was able to kind of cushion that in with, okay, here's what you want. This is the price. Here's why you want it. And then how does that sound to you? So mm -hmm. giving them that framework um, was really important to me. And it was coming from a very organic place. That didn't sound salesy to me. That was very honest and true because I was um, aligning their needs with what I actually am able to provide. And if I wasn't able to provide it, then, you know, I referred out. Um, but yeah, I think that was very helpful learning how to be a saleswoman. Um, mm -hmm. but man, that was hard. And the other thing that was really hard, um, was holy cow, the fear. <laughs> 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 like I didn't, like, I didn't realize that like as a business owner, I don't know if this is particular to females, but as a business owner, there was a lot of fear that came up. So something new and out of my comfort zone that would come up like networking events used to hate going to those and like talking about myself. Um, I, I hated going to them. So I had to overcome a lot of fear, but learn how to take action, even though there was that fear. So when you feel fear, there's resistance and you stop. Mm -hmm. um, when I first felt that I was like, what the heck is this? I don't know how to deal with this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then once I realized what it was, um, I was able to just kind of take little baby steps and figure out how to overcome that. Um, and, you know, just keep making progress and it's good enough. It's good enough the way it is. Um, and we'll tweak it next time. Like always being flexible was so important for me. Right, right. We don't grow in our comfort zone. Mm -mm, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Yeah, you got to kind of like step into the unknown to grow sometimes. I think it's like you got to get right up to to what it is and like let yourself figure it out. And yeah. Work on it. yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. It's not easy. No, um, but being aware that it's there is so yeah. helpful. So knowing yeah. that it's going to happen, but you just have to be able to ride that wave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you are, I want to go back and ask you a question. You were saying um, when you uh, were kind of selling your services to parents, you know, you're saying, you know, this is what I can do for you. This is what it's going to cost. What do you think? You know, how do you feel about is It was like, how do you feel about that? Or what does that sound like to you? That kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. How does that sound? Ended mm -hmm. at that. <laughs> yeah. And then are you doing that over the phone or was that after an evaluation already? Um, it actually starts on the phone um, because the evaluation price comes up over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, it, after the phone call, then it comes up again um, when we've done the evaluation. So after my recommendations of frequency of treatment, because a lot of my recommendations for frequency of treatment are not one time a week, which is I feel like my old standard was, and that was what I was taught in my brain from a facility. Um, my new standard is most of the time, if you don't have therapy two times a week, you're not going to make progress. Um, so being able to educate parents on that. And if I recommended more than two times a week, three times a week or four, how does that sound to you? Leaving it right there and then just letting the parents answer, um, I was able to gauge on their readiness to commit to therapy and what they were um, able to do. And sometimes we would negotiate about frequency mm -hmm. and we'd say, okay, let's try it at two times a week. And then if we feel like you need more, then we'll reassess in a month. So, yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what do you say to people when they ask, do you take my insurance? Um, I don't get that direct question, but I can give you a little bit of advice. Yeah. So what's that. the question that you, what is the question that you get? Cause that's a <sighs> question I know I get and a lot of other uh -huh. people get. Uh -huh. Um, a lot of people already know that I'm a fee-based service, so they don't ask that, but they do say, um, you know, well, how do you work with insurance? Or I have this insurance. Um, they say you're out of network, so how can I get you as a provider? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're moving now. <laughs> <laughs> you're live again. <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay. 
So they want to know, because I do help parents initially file self claims. Um, they want to know how I can help out with that. So I explained to them, you know, I will call your provider if you need me to, um, and see how many office visits you need. Um, and we'll also work on, um, filling out the self claim together the very first time, because the first time parents look at it or even think about looking at it, mm -hmm. they are overwhelmed. It looks like a completely foreign language. So I want to help them with that process so they don't feel overwhelmed if they do want to fill out self claims. Otherwise, a lot of times I'll just have parents say, if you don't take my insurance, I'm not going to go with you. And they don't say it like that to me. But a lot of the times I speak to the mothers and um, they hear my price. If they are on the fence about the price, they say something like, I need to talk to my husband about it or let me call you back and I'm going to do a little bit of research and I'll call you back. Um, so that's the key point when I need to follow up with them or make sure that I get a come confirmed. Um, are you going to, you know, when will you be following up? That's basic question. Um, so getting that timeline from them. So they have that in their head. Um, but I guess, yeah, it's never really come up about, do you take my insurance? Mm -hmm. What's come up more in that realm is when I get Medicaid or CMS calls. Um, if people want services and they're very adamant that they get services, um, I just have to let them know that I can't take any cash based Medicaid services. I just won't do that personally, um, because I haven't researched it enough on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, the one opportunity that I do have for those clients, um, that are interested in services is I do group classes. So I allow them, um, to have the opportunity to join the group classes if they, if they'd like, um, because those services aren't covered by Medicaid. So the group classes are a little bit um, more well-being. Um, I did yoga for a little while. I'm starting mm -hmm. a fine motor and sensory group um, coming up here soon. So those Medicaid patients are able to take advantage of that. And that's what I share with them. Um, but yeah, as far as those people, I will just refer them elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of people are interested in um, some of the like finer details of your yeah. practice. Yeah, um, yeah. So one of the things that uh, people want to know and like from the chat box and from questions beforehand um, is like, what are you charging for your sessions and are you putting together any packages? Um, that kind of thing. Like, and, and then let me follow that up with how did you decide upon your rates too? You know, so. Okay. I'll, I'm going to answer them in the reverse order. Yeah, <laughs> so I decided my rates because I did research on what the area was charging. There is not very many cash-based practices out in my area. Um, I can think off the top of my head, two. Um, there are other cash-based pediatric practices that are not solely cash-based. They're like, I would say, 80% insurance and then out-of-pocket, they'll they'll do cash based. Um, so I looked at their prices. Um, that is something that people are not open about. And I will totally be open about because that is one of the most difficult things for me in the beginning to establish my rates. Um, so I found out that depending on the facility, um, the facilities were charging anywhere between like 100 and 250 per treatment session. Um, and I would say the most common range was one to 150, 100 to 150. Um, the private practitioners like myself um, that are in the same role as I am, they're only themselves. They're, um, you know, going out into the community or going out into schools. Um, they were charging 100 or 125 per hour. Um, and then for me, I wanted to know more about why were they charging that. So I did more research on um, and coming from um, doing some billing from outpatient therapy, I knew what a billable unit was worth. So I knew at the facility that I was at, a billable unit, a large facility, a billable unit was $50. Um, and now um, when I looked at smaller facilities, it was about $25 to $30. So a unit and a unit is, you know, 15 minutes. So you break that down into an hour and you can kind of calculate it out. Um, for me, because I started out small and I still wanted my price to be reasonable, um, I'll just go back to a mistake that I made at the beginning. I started out at 150 um, flat for, uh, for an hour. Um, I wasn't getting a lot of like bites from clients from that. I wasn't getting a lot of success. Um, once I lowered it to $100 an hour, 
total game changer. Like I was getting so many more clients um, with $100 an hour. Um, So that is what I currently charge. I based it off of Medicaid rates um, instead of the facility rates themselves, Mm -hmm. even though I knew what they were. Medicaid reimburses anywhere from um, I think it's like $23 to $28 for a billable unit. Um, So that's how I explain my prices to parents. Um, I tell them, you know, my rates are based off of research that I've done through Medicaid and through other professionals in the area. Um, My rate is in the middle. It's $25 Mm -hmm. for 15 minutes. So if you equal that into an hour, that's $100 an hour. Um, The first session that I always have with them is two hours long. So they know it's going to be $200. If I have to do a little bit of extra, it's usually like $225 or $250. And they know that. So if I go over a lot of extra, Mm -hmm. Um, they will be charged that $25 depending on what was needed. Um, So yeah, it just kind of goes from there. And some parents, it's really interesting to hear the variety in um, what people have experienced. I had one mom tell me she came up from the Northeast and she used to pay $250 in the Northeast for a half hour OT session private out of pocket, no insurance coverage. So once she heard my price, she was like, Oh my gosh, that's so cheap. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I was like, okay, I need to raise my rates. (laughs) But at the same time, I was very happy to hear that she was happy with that price. Um, And then um, I'll get another um, end of the spectrum where people are just used to paying for their $45 copay. Um, so that takes just an education component about, you know, where their $45 copay is going to and the process that it takes to actually get reimbursed. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, are you also like, let's see, I'm just reading one of the questions here. Um, are you also charging for consulting with teachers and other people or other healthcare providers, or is that part of your hour? Is that part of your service? Where does that fit in? I charge the parents for that. Mm -hmm. So it's not the teachers that pay that because it's the parents that arrange it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So Mm -hmm. they do get charged for that. So when I consult with the teachers, um, yep, they pay me for however long I spent with the teachers. So if it's a half hour, it's $50. If it was a full hour, it's the full hundred. So it's Mm -hmm. like paying for another session um, because really it's benefiting their child's care. So yeah, yeah, it is an extra charge. Yeah. Awesome. And are you, when you're documenting, are you documenting on the go? Do you, are you taking your laptop or something else with you or using paper, EMR? It's, what do you use? It's both. It's not, it's not smooth. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do both because while I'm in the session with the kid, I don't want my computer out because it's distracting. Um, so they have their own folders and mm-hmm. I document um, in their folders as well. Um, what the parents really love is that um, they're able to get copies of this and create their own um, almost like, uh, their own in-home binder of the notes that I take in session. And mm-hmm. the parents love that to be able to uh, repeat what I've done in a session with their child later. Um, awesome. So that's the note taking part of it. And then documentation happens later on. Um, yeah. I document after the sessions on the computer. So yeah. Awesome. And are the, are some of the kids that you're seeing, are they also getting um, in-home physical therapy, speech therapy and, you know, are, the, are those same parents utilizing other smaller private practices for that type of, do you, know, do you have an idea? Some, yes, it depends. Um, there's not a lot of in-home pediatric therapy in my area. So that really is my niche. Mm-hmm. Um, there are physical therapists that treat some of my kids in home. Um, a lot of them are just going to private, uh, private, um, OTs or PTs or just the large clinics. So they do already have, not OT, but they already have PT or speech, Mm -hmm. um, either in school or at another clinic. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And, um, is there like, so in that, are you able to market yourself to kids that just need pediatric care at home versus whether it's OT, PT? I mean, is that, is that something that you're broaching? Cause I know there's a lot of overlap between what we can all do. You know, exactly. Yeah. Um, I do. I'm a very gross motor based um, occupational therapist. Mm -hmm. So for the kids to refine their fine motor skills, I believe that they need to start at the core. And there's so many more gross motor and coordination skills, body awareness wise, that they need to just even 
function <laughs> in right. life. So there's a lot of overlap with what I do with PT. Um, so I will, if I feel like I don't have the skills to um, develop those or like teach the child and the parent those gross mm-hmm. motor skills, I'll refer out to PT. Um, but I mean, there are people that I work with, yes, that I reach out to. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I mean, there's never really been, um, I don't know, there's never yeah. really been that issue. Are people uh, or parents, are they conf- do they know what you do before they contact you? Or, do, you know, is it like, do they know what an occupational therapist is or does or what can do for them? Sometimes. It's so interesting. Yeah, that's a great question, too, because it's just like the gamut of prices um, with what they're used to paying insurance or out of pocket wise. It, I would say it's 50 50. There are some parents that have been in therapy and um, they've been out of therapy for a while. They realize the benefits of therapy of OT specifically and they want to get back into it. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's the other parents that just know know that there's something wrong with their child. And those are a lot of the parents that I get referrals from We Rock the Spectrum. So they hear about this gym. It has the name Spectrum in it. They're like, oh, there's something wrong with my child. I've suspected that they're on the spectrum. Let me go here. So because the gym owner and I are so close, if the parent actually ends up talking to the gym owner Mm -hmm. um, and opens up to her, which everybody like just feels like they need to share with her because she's just that type of person. Mm -hmm. Um, Because we're so close, she's a great referral source for me. Um, that educates the parents like, hey, Vanessa might be able to help you out and just realize if there's anything um, that, you know, you're concerned about, she may be able to help with. Um, So those are the parents that really I educate for the first time about what OT is because they're just like, I know something's wrong, but I can't pinpoint it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, So let's say someone I want your advice on this. So there's, you know, there's a question I got, but it's like, so someone like me who's mostly T's adults, you know, mm-hmm. let's say I wanted to get into pediatrics or, or, you know, kind of open into that market. This is a question I got from someone who said, well, how would I break into the market not being specifically a pediatric therapist? Do you have any advice for someone who is looking to start mm. pediatrics or open their practice into pediatrics? That's an awesome question. I have two people that have recently come into my life that are like this. Um, They're both OTs and they both work in skilled nursing facilities. Um, They've never gone out on their own, um, but they introduced themselves to me because to break into the pediatric world, you need pediatric experience. Like, um, the only exception to that I would say is if you have a certain certification um, that you know that applies to adults and pediatrics very easily, like take kinesio taping, for example, take, um, there's some aspects of yoga that I would say could apply to that um, or take massage, those kind of like body work or manual techniques you can figure out pretty easily on kids unless they have a very like critically medical condition. Um, Those areas I feel like are really easy to tap into without having that pediatric experience. um, If you have those specific certifications that you feel like overlap between adults and peds a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, Pool therapy, aquatics is a big one too, because I've done aquatic therapy as well too um in that i feel like is very applicable to overlap and start with um as far as the other um areas of pediatrics if you want to get into more like developmental stuff um i think it is really important to have some sort of observational or volunteer hours or just getting involved in the community somehow to see um what typical and atypical looks like so you actually know Mm -hmm. what you're treating because you can tell like just because you are a therapist where whether their motor patterns or whether their compensations are uh typical or not right? right but then because they're a child, they're still developing and you have to know, well, how fast are they going to make progress in therapy or is it that just their development that's going to catch up to them? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So being able to kind of see that skill and learn the behavioral component of pediatrics, I think it, observation and volunteering or community work is key. Um, But the reason why at the very beginning, I brought up those other two women, um, they, one of them works in a skilled nursing facility, and she wants to transition into um, pediatrics. So she herself, I don't think is going um, 
into her own business yet, but she wants to work at a large facility like the one that I came from. The second one um, I share with you, she is amazing. And I hope people um, reach out to her after this because she is an occupational therapist. Um, She's 31 years old and she used to work in a skilled nursing facility, but she has autism herself. Um, she recently introduced herself to me, um, and she has aspirations to start her own pediatric business because working in the skilled nursing facility, um, she just was way overstimulated and she will tell you admittedly that she has meltdowns at the end of the day because she can't handle that huge, um, clinic setting. She can't Mm -hmm. handle that stimulation of the environment of multiple people, you know, 10 people in a treatment room at the same time. So she's observing me closely and we're actually starting a class together, um, to educate parents and the kids about, um, autism through life. So it's just, yeah, there's people like that, that are out there that, that want to do it and are just finding ways to do it through just putting themselves out there and saying, Hey, my name, is so and so reach out reach out to somebody in that world and that'll be a huge start that's really cool that's cool mm-hmm. yeah. um something that i wanted to ask you about a little while ago but uh you're you, you said you've been doing teaching yoga stuff so you must practice yoga right yeah, i so. do yeah yeah that's awesome. Are you a yoga teacher as well? Or you just incorporate your knowledge? No, I just incorporate my knowledge into practice just through being in pediatrics for so many years. Um, I did yoga, you know, there's so many yoga outlets out there for kids now Mm -hmm. anyway. Um, But we did that at the clinic that I used to work at. And then also just I've done yoga for the last five, eight years of my life. So incorporating both of those things together has been really fun. Yeah, yeah, I do yoga too. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But yeah. uh, so the, the, my, my, my big question for that is like, how are you balance? Is, is your practice allow you to balance your work and life and yoga life and all these other things that you want to do? Or is, I mean, and how are you setting that up? How have you set that up? Um, you get to go to yoga like four times a week? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't do yoga that much. Um, I do yoga about twice a week, um, yeah. but I do enjoy going to the gym. So mm-hmm. I've just made that a habit. Um, I purposefully... Uh, schedule patients around certain hours of the day. But not only that, most of my kids, if they are in school, they need to be seen during certain times of the day. So what I love is that I have most of my mornings free. So that's when I'm able to do most of my everyday things or, you know, if I go to the gym or run my errands or whatnot, Mm -hmm. um, do continuing ed, um, continue to grow my business in new ways and develop new ideas. That's when I do that is in the morning time. And then I see most of my clients like 11 a.m. and later. So that's pretty nice (laughs) to be able to balance that. Yeah. 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 yeah, That's great. I mean, that's a big thing for me is like, I get to balance a lot of different things by Mm -hmm. being the owner of my own schedule. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. You know, so um, we're wrapping up in just a few minutes. Um, If anyone else has a burning question for Vanessa, enter it in the chat box. But um, what I, what I want you to do is give us your, um, I want you to give me or not your, someone listening who's like, I want to start a practice, but I don't know how or, or I'm getting ready to next month. What's your best advice for that person? You know, what would, you know, to get into practice? into like cash-based practice or private practice. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have to research what's out there, right? So you need to know what's out there in your community to be able to even see if it's viable. Um, Is there other practitioners out there doing what you're doing or are you a niche? And if you are, what is your niche? What's your why I think is really important. Why are you doing this? Um, And having a goal. So having a goal in terms of short-term goal, like in six months, I want my clients to be at this, or in six months, I want to see these results from my business. Um, And then having a long-term goal, like, do you want to end up opening up a clinic or do you want to always be a um, sole practitioner and just go out and see your own clients or have your own, you know, building that you rent space from. So knowing those kinds of things. Um, I think the other thing is if you want to start um, soon, (laughs) Mm -hmm. 
you need to have go-to people. Like you just need to have those people that you can bounce ideas off of. Because for me, when I felt like I didn't have people to bounce ideas off of in the very, very beginning, um, before I met all of those people, uh, that was really tough for me. So just get your ideas out there, share them with people. And um, networking is huge. And, and networking isn't like this big, like I have to go to an event. Any person that you have an interaction with could be somebody that knows somebody that needs your services. So always keeping that in the back of your mind um, and coming from your true self is going to help mm -hmm. you along the way. Awesome. Truly. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm going to ask this uh, last question in the third person, third person, <laughs> you know, like they do in Italy. Um, what's, <laughs> what's next for Vanessa? <laughs> oh, what's next for Vanessa? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I want to expand into, uh, okay, so this sounds silly. I want to expand into parent coaching and um, coaching other um, therapists that want to get into private practice. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, very fun. Um, awesome. So um, if someone wants to get in touch with you or find out more about you, can you tell us what your, what's your website and how do we find you online? Like email yeah. address if you're on any social media. Yeah. That would be yep. great. So I have a Facebook page. It's movement with meaning. Um, you can just search me on Facebook for that. Um, my email is info at movement with meaning Tampa.com. And my website is movement with meaning Tampa.com. Awesome. Um, anything else? On Twitter? There are a lot of PTs am, on Twitter. I am not on Twitter. I don't know. Is that something I should be on? Um, I would say Twitter's great for connecting with other therapists. Um, okay. Not, okay. It hasn't been like, I'm not getting patients off of Twitter. It's more yeah. about connecting with other therapists on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, patients are... You know, patients aren't even really finding us find, you know, it's more Google's number one for patients for me. Oh, um, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, uh, for Twitter, sure. Twitter um, would be, was a great place to uh, connect with other therapists and on conversations about business and, and interventions and all that stuff. So awesome. check it out. Okay. I checked, I started doing it a couple years ago and it's been pretty awesome. So. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. I want to throw this out there. If anybody uh, wants to shoot me a text, I'm going to give my phone number. Is that okay? Oh, that's perfectly okay. Okay. Wonderful. So my phone number is 813-448-2858. Just shoot me a text if you have any questions about anything and didn't want to ask it on there. So. Thanks. <laughs> That's really awesome. That's really awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been awesome having you on. Yeah. I really appreciate your time and taking time out of your day. And um, I learned a, I learned a ton, of, you know, and uh, I hope other people did too. And I really appreciate you sharing all your business insights and everything. Um, I think what you're doing is really awesome. So keep it up. Thank you. Thank you for having right. me. It's You're fun. welcome. So um, for all you guys out there, this is Aaron LeBauer and Vanessa Fox, the Cash BT Lunch Hour. And uh, stay tuned and we'll see you next time. Bye.